Praise the Lord. Welcome to another live recording of Hand of God Live. Uh, my, my ministry is live on the internet as well as in front of a studio audience. And we shoot it live every week, every Sabbath uh, at 9 a.m. in the morning. My name is Sean Henry Scott Sr. I go by the position of the Apostle in the Body of Jesus Christ. And like I said, this is the Hand of God Live. If you're tuning in by uh, Ustream, you can feel free to call us or contact us anytime you want at 614 847 2057. We also have a Florida number, but I don't know about heart yet. So if you're in the Florida area, Riviera Beach, West Palm area, South Florida area, you can stop by and visit with us at 1901 Broadway, Riviera Beach, Florida, 33419. And today we'll be speaking on the subject Have you seen the Lord? Have you seen the Lord? We'll be in the Gospel according to John. Chapter 20, I read and study and preach out of the King James Version of the Bible, so if you're following along, you can do that. And today, like I said, we'll be speaking on the subject, Have You Seen the Lord? Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank and praise you for waking us up, allowing us to be amongst the land of the living. We thank you, Father God, for your grace and your mercy. It's only by your grace and your mercy that we're here, Father God. It's only by your power and your demonstration that the earth is still here. We thank and praise you, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We know beyond a shadow of any doubt, Father God, that you are God. You are the Lord all by yourself, and you are one, Lord Jesus. I just ask and pray that you have your will and your way. Lead us, guide us, direct us, and everything we should do, we will say, Father God. The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Father God. In the name of Jesus, I only want to speak the words you speak through me. There's somebody out there in desperate need to get in contact with you, Father God, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for sending me here to Riviera Beach, Florida, to touch lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Use me continuously, Father God. Let the, let the anointing destroy each and every yoke, Father God. That, that, that drug addiction, that poverty, in the name of Jesus. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, like I said, I'll be coming out of the gospel according to John chapter 20. And we're speaking on the subject, have you seen the Lord? Have you seen the Lord? We're going to read it. And I'm going to exhort as I go along. And the reason this wise, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and see if the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Verse 3, Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. Verse 5, And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying in, yet went he not in. So he beat Peter to the sepulchre, but he didn't want to go in. Some revelation knowledge in that alone. So what we see already in verse 20 is that Mary came and told them they have, they have taken the body of Jesus Christ. We see here, this is, this is after the crucifixion. This is after they, they put him in a tomb, after the tomb was closed. This is after the angels came and moved the stone and did what they did. And now Mary went and told the guys, they, they take, they've taken Jesus. Have you seen the Lord? They've taken him. And then we see two disciples who want to come and, 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 and investigate what Mary is talking about. So they're running to the tomb frantically. And we see this other disciple outran Peter to the tomb, but he didn't have the faith to go in. He was, he, he, he says, he, the Bible says he looked in, verse 5, and stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes, yet went he not in. Verse 6, then, then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and see if the linen clothes. So Peter came. And he didn't hesitate. Peter came and went right in. He didn't even hesitate to go in. Remember, you remember him on the water? Same situation. He didn't, he didn't hesitate. A lot of times in life, we hesitate to do the things that God has called us to do. And as a result, we don't get to operate in the faith that God has given us to operate in. So he didn't hesitate. Peter came, even though he got outran. That's a revelation I was in that. There's a reason why God allowed that to be put into his word, is that the both the disciples were running to the tomb, but he beat Peter to the tomb. He got there first, 
but he didn't want to, he looked in, but he didn't want to go in. Peter came, ran straight in. He didn't even hesitate. I hear, I hear the Spirit speaking to me saying that a lot of times we don't get the blessings that, that, that we're supposed to have is because we hesitate. We, we may be the first in the church building, but are you believing the message that's being preached? You may, you may be the first person to get your money, but are you sowing your first fruits? You may the first, what the Bible says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Just because you get there first don't mean anything in Christ Jesus. You've got to have the faith to go in. That's right. You've got to have the faith to go in. I hear the Spirit saying that. So six again. Then come up Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and see if the linen clothes lie. Verse seven. And the napkin that was about his head not laying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself. So they see everything nice and neatly put there. Verse eight. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher. And he saw and believed. You hear that? Then went in also the other disciple. So he comes, and he comes in. This is when he, he believed after he see. This is the one that outran Peter to the tomb. I want, you to, I want you to pay attention to the details. So often we miss the details and miss the revelation knowledge that God is trying to speak to us. So he beat Peter to the tomb, but he didn't have the faith to go in. I don't know if it was the spirit of fear. The Bible doesn't say what the problem was, but he peeked in. But on verse 8 it says, Then went also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. So he wouldn't believe until after he saw. So we all talk about Doubting Thomas, and we're going to get to him in a minute here. We all talk about him, but we didn't talk about this other disciple who actually beat Peter to the sepulcher. He got there and he stopped. But this, 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 but, but Peter went in. But this one says, it says, Then went also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and he believed. So he did not believe until he saw. That's when he believed. Verse 9, For as yet they know not the, the, the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So verse 9 lets us know, we in John chapter 20, okay. For as yet they knew not the, the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciples went away again unto their own home. So we see the disciples running to the sepulcher to see where they had laid Jesus. Mary came and gave a report that they've taken the body of Jesus Christ. I'm in verse 10. They've taken the body of Jesus Christ and I don't know what they've done, done with him. And now the disciples run and it says, then the disciples went away to their own home. So after they see that Jesus is not in the tomb, they all run home. To report to the other disciples, hey man, the body of Jesus is gone. Uh, chapter 20, we're on verse 10 right now. John. So then the disciples, are, are, they, they done ran, they said, we don't know where he is. And we're speaking on the subject again, have you seen the Lord? They've taken his body, so they, they, they don't, we don't know where he went. All, that, all, the, all the stuff he was saying to them, preaching and talking to them in parables, preparing them for what exactly was going to happen when he went to Jerusalem, and even when he rose again, he let them know. But now the body is gone, and now they're tripping. There are things that will happen in our lives that God will prepare us for. There is not one solitary thing you will experience in your life that God will not prepare you for. I tell people all the time, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And the only people that's prepared for heaven is going to go to heaven. Not people who say they want to go just because they want to go. Not people that's been poor. Not people that's rich. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And the Bible lets us know how to go to heaven. So if you're not prepared to go to heaven, you're not going to go. And the only, only all other alternative for destination for eternal life is hell. I don't like preaching about hell because I'm trying to get people in heaven. Verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. So as Mary sitting there at the stone crying and weeping like they done took his body. Uh, what they done did with his body. Tripping out. Verse 12. And see if two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. So she's sitting there at the sepulcher, and she's crying and weeping, and there's angels inside. There's one at the top, and there's one at the bottom. 13, and they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto him, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And the subject of this sermon, once again, is have you seen the Lord? I know so often in, in, in life that we, we hear about people going to jail, and they say, well, when he was in jail, he found Jesus. Well, I, last time I checked, Jesus ain't hiding. How you find something that's not lost? 
Jesus is here right now waiting for anybody and everybody to accept him. No matter what condition or position you find your life and yourself in, Jesus is here waiting for you. We're not waiting for Jesus. Jesus is waiting for us. And we're talking about how have you seen the Lord. Verse 14 says, And when she had run thus, said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. So the Bible says in verse 14, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not it was Jesus. So Jesus was standing there behind the angels and she didn't even know it was Jesus. That's why the title of the sermon is, Have You Seen the Lord? They took him out of the stone. The disciples looked in and realized he was gone. And they, they, their first thought was that somebody had told, stole the body, not so much that he arose from the dead. And then verse says, And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew that it was not Jesus. This is one thing that destroys every ideology in the entire world is the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. No other God in the history of the planet Earth ever claimed to raise from the dead, not Buddha, not Allah, none of them. Jesus Christ is the only God that ever claimed to raise from the dead. And that's the difference between who the God we serve and the God that everybody else serves. Because if your God is still dead, how can he save you? Common sense. A dead person can't save no live person or a person that's about to die. When we pray, we don't pray to a dead Jesus, we pray to a live Jesus. Verse 15, Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? That happened to me when I was broke, busted, and disgusted, and ready to give up on life. God spoke to me just the way he spoke to her and said, Sean, why are you tripping? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who gave you purpose. You didn't try anything and everything in this world, but you ain't never tried me. You was raised in church. When you got in high school, you left church. Got you a girl, thought you were grown, doing your thing. And now your life is torn up and you wonder why. Jesus says, what, what are you crying for? Cry out to me. I will save you. So Jesus said unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She's supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him. So she's asking, she, she don't even turn around, but Jesus is right behind her, and, he, and she's asking him, like, gardener, where, where did you put the body of Jesus so I can go and tend to him? 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. Now, this is how you always going to know the voice of God. I tell people who don't even know God, when you pray and you cry to the real God, he will answer you. I tell people that all the time. I say pray and God will answer you. As soon as, soon as he said her name, she turned herself around. She knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was Jesus. So Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself around and saith unto him, Rabboni, which means master. 17, Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. For I have not ascended to my father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascended unto my father, and your father, and to my God, and to your God. So here was Mary sitting behind, Mary sitting there, I like painting a picture, because I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, so I like visualizing how I can imagine how it was, and we've seen this movie, Jesus movie, play time and time again, but this is one part that's not necessarily in there, how it was that she went to the tomb, and the tomb was empty, and she's sitting there crying like they done took the body. Something happened to the body. And here was Jesus standing behind there, and he sat there and asked her and says, Mary, why weepest thou? Why are you weeping? You can ask yourself that. When you're going through stuff in your life, you can literally ask yourself, why am I going through this? I, I tell people all the time, with, with, with sure, fuel, sure, I got seven kids, I tell them the same thing that when they go through stuff. I said, did you pray? I'm your natural father, but you have a spiritual father that you can pray to, and he will answer you. Most of them say, Dad, you know, you're just saying that because you're a preacher. No, I'm not. I'm saying that because it worked for me. Every preacher, pastor, Christian, or believer, if they don't have a testimony about how God saved them, they're not saved. You don't have to be Mary or Peter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John to experience the Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, we're going to get into a part of the scripture where it's talked about how we're more blessed. 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. And that he has spoken these things unto her. Now, they bugging. They're like, what What you mean they seen him? They crucified him on the cross. They put him in a sepulcher. She coming and telling him. And if you don't know who Mary Magdalene was, you do your homework. A lot of people think they can't be saved because their life is so bad. They've done so many wrong things. I've killed people. I've stole. I've murdered. I've had sex. I've married. Well, Mary Magdalene was a round the way girl. If you don't know who Mary Magdalene was, she, she was one of them chicks who got paid for doing using herself. 
That's who she was according to scriptures. But when she gave her life to Jesus Christ, she turned it all around. I've ministered to people in the streets for 25 years, and I've heard people give me every excuse in the world why they can't believe in Jesus Christ. I'm like, come on, man. There's people in the Bible who done murdered people and came to the Lord. Matter of fact, it's a guy by the name of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who used to murder Christians. His job was to find Christians and kill them. And God saved him. That was his job, find them Christians. Anybody that's calling on the name of Jesus, find them and kill them. So you ain't done nothing so bad that Jesus can't save you. 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews came, fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of to them and said, Peace be unto you. Verse 20. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were his disciples glad. So Jesus showed up and he showed them where they had pierced him in his hands and in his side. He's like, Look, it's me. Because they was tripping. Mary Magdalene ran back to where they was at and was like, Hey, the body gone. And they're like, Man, what are you talking about? Jesus is dead. They buried him. What are you talking about? And then he's like, okay. Mary went back. She's sitting there like, man, why don't y'all believe me? So then he shows up. He says, look, it's me. See that? That's where they pierced me. My side. This is where they pierced me. That's what it says. It says, when he is so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then where the disciples were glad, they saw the Lord. They was happy now. It is Jesus. That's where they pierced him. So he proved himself. And I say to you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus will show up and show out in your life. When you cry out to him, he will show you who he is. No, you're not going to see his piercings because you're not going to see him in the flesh. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But I'll tell you this beyond a shadow of a doubt. You're going to know God is God when he show up in your life. This is what I tell people because I had a Muslim one time. I was like, how do you know your God, God is Jesus and all this and all that? I said, all I know is when I was broke, busting, disgusted, and ready to give up on life, and I cried out for somebody to save me, Jesus showed up. Nobody else showed up. Allah didn't show up. Buddha didn't show up. Confucius didn't show up. Jesus is the one who saved Sean. Did nobody else? And what, what did he save me from? He didn't save me from drugs, alcohol, chicks. He saved me from myself. I was my own worst enemy because I thought of every reason in the world why I couldn't make it in this world. And if I had to make it, I had to do something that was stupid. And Jesus is like, that's not true. I allowed your grandfather to meet your grandmother and your father to meet your mother and for you to come forth. I allowed all that to happen so I could have you on this earth doing my work. And he had to show me how, how, how that was going to happen. Verse 21, Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as many as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. So now he's letting them know, look, my Father sent me, now I'm about to send you. And that's what he told me. He says, look, I saved you for a purpose, a reason, and a season. And if you trust me to teach you what you need to do, I'm going to send you out to do this. 22, And when they had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I love that, that scripture breathe on them because there's two passages in scriptures where God breathed on man, humankind. One was in Genesis when he created Adam out of the dust of the ground. He breathed in his nostrils and made him a living soul. And two right here we see where God breathed on them and he gave them the Holy Spirit. So they're going to have the power to do things. 23. Whosoever sins, your sins they remit. And whosoever they are remitted unto them and who so ever sins you retain, they retain. Meaning, they have the power to tell a person that your sins are forgiven through the power of Jesus Christ. And he has also the power to retain sin. So if a person don't receive Jesus Christ, they just keep it moving. In other words, they have the power to retain sins. Like, hey, your sins are, are on you. And you don't want that to happen. Hey, man, would you tell him we have in church? You got to come back. Thank you. That's going to have to wait. Verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So Thomas, Thomas wasn't with them. When, 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 all, when all of them had seen what happened, this whole thing happened, Thomas wasn't with them. Thomas came in late. He wasn't with them when this was going on. That's why we hear the, the old saying, doubting Thomas. So all this thing went on, and Thomas shows up late. We don't know where he was at. He was somewhere fishing, maybe on a boat. Who knows what Thomas was doing? So the scripture says, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Twenty-five, the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. So they're telling Thomas, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto him, Except I, I shall see in his hands the print of nails, and put my finger into the print of nails, and thirst my hands into his sides, I will not believe. 
That's how, that's how it is today, Miss Marie. We tell people about Jesus. We preach about Jesus. We put up signs about Jesus. We give out free food in the name of Jesus. We pray for people in the name of Jesus. And people still say in their head, I don't believe this stuff. Thomas was like, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my hands in the prints and on the side. I'm not going to believe. I tell my kids like this, because my kids, if you can't, if you're not ministering to your house, you ain't really got no business preaching to nobody else. I tell my kids like this all the time, the only reason your dad is still alive is because of Jesus. I was done. I had 45s in my face. I've been shot at. All kinds of things. I should have been gone. It was like the Matrix. God allowed me to see bullets flying past my head. I remember one time, I'm going to tell the story, because people don't think I don't live nothing for work. Something. They think when you saved, you've always been saved. Please. My knucklehead fake brother said, hey, man, let's go, let's go for a ride. And I should have known better because he sold drugs. So I rode with him to a crack house. So we need to get gas. Well, I didn't know it was a crack house. I should have known. So we ride to the house. He said, I need to get changed for this hundred because the gas station don't take hundreds. So we go in his house. Dark as all get up. We in his house for two seconds. All I hear is boom, boom, the door get kicked down. SWAT come busting in. I get knocked down. There's a big old refrigerator between my legs and a 45 and a flashlight in my face. I said, man, how in the world did I end up here? Then the news come because they just happened to be recording a, 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 a SWAT raid. And so now on, on top of all this nonsense, now I'm about to be on news for just riding with somebody to get some change from a crack house. And I didn't know it was a crack house. I'm like 500 people in this place. How does all get up? And I'm sweating. The guy's in handcuffs sitting there. I'm sweating. I got a goose down coat on. We in Columbus. And the officer said, if you don't swallow some crack, just tell me so we can get you to the hospital. I said, dude, I'm sweating because it's hot. That's just one of the many situations and circumstances. And they let us go. Nothing happened. They, they let us go because, you know, it wasn't our house. It wasn't our place. So they let us go. You got to see. But Thomas, one of the 12 gentlemen said, he said, unless I see the hands, unless I feel the side, I ain't going to believe it's Jesus. And like I said, we hear that all the time. People say, I ain't going to believe in that Jesus. Let me tell you something. You better believe in Jesus before you close your eyes for the final time. There's heaven and there's hell. Ain't no, ain't no middle ground. I tell people all the time, I say, you ain't got to believe me. Believe Jesus. You ain't got to believe what I'm saying. 25 or 26. He says, I will not, he says, I will not believe in verse 25. Unless he do that. 26. And after eight days, again, his disciples were with him, and Thomas was with them. This is eight days that went past. Jesus came to the door, being shut, and stood in the midst of them and says, Peace be unto you. So after eight days, Jesus came back and said, Peace be unto you. Stood in the door. Thomas was here this time. <laughs> Verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold thy hands, reach there into thy hands and thirst them into my side and be and be not faithless but believing. So he told Thomas, go ahead, touch, touch it. John chapter 20. Be not faithless. He said, touch it. I'm Jesus. Touch, touch where they nailed me, touch where they pierced me, and be not faithless. And I'm gonna say this to you sitting here. You're never gonna have the opportunity to touch where they nailed Jesus and touch this side. But in order for you to know Jesus, you got to have faith. Because Hebrews says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I have little smart people trying to, trying to talk crazy to me all the time. You ain't never seen Jesus. Not in the flesh, no. I've seen the manifestation of Jesus in my life. I ask people all the time, what woke you up this morning? Our alarm clock, brother, sister, birds, trees, deers, alligators, guy goes, what, what, what woke you up? You think you woke yourself up? You think you told your body to get up? Well, look in the paper right now. I guarantee you somebody didn't wake up last night. Your time was up here on earth. You have no control over when your time is up here on earth. Like, my son played against that dude who, at Butler who just died. 25 years old. He was in the final four for Butler. Brad Stevens, old player. 25 years old, gone. It's a dude we feed to Parker. Oh, dude, he said his son is 33 years old. He said cancer is spreading all throughout his body. He asked us for prayer. We are not promised tomorrow. I don't understand people. Life is here and then you gone. The Bible says life is like a vapor, like when you spray like some lights or something, and you see the mist, and then the mist disappears. That's what they say life is. I don't care if you live to be 100 years, it's still short. It's amazing how, how light people take life. You see people out on the road, crossing the road, and traffic is crazy. Why would you risk your life crossing the road? Why is the chicken cross the road to get to the other side? Unless you run it to Jesus, I wouldn't risk it. Verse 27, then said Thomas, reach thy finger, and behold thy hands. Reach into thy hands, and thrust into my side. He says, be not faithless. Let me tell you this. Whenever you decide to cry to Jesus, have faith. I don't know when that is. 
It's not up to me and Ms. Reed when you come to Jesus. It's up to you when you come to Jesus. All we can do is present Jesus by preaching and sharing and teaching. That's all we can do. You never, no one should never force you into knowing Jesus. It's something we present. Like it was presented to me. I needed an out and he offered an out. I needed a better life and he offered a better life. And I said, hey, what the heck, I can try this. Ain't a, my life is, ain't, ain't that great that I can't, I needed help. I said, I'm gonna try anything. But drugs, I wasn't into that. I couldn't even swallow pills, aspirin. I was raised in church. My mom took me to church. Grandma took me to church. So I knew the way. It's just I didn't like how they did it. All that hollering and screaming, shouting, huffing and puffing. I didn't like none of that. I was like, oh no. I played drums in church. That was cool. I like the chicks. They dress good on Sundays. Smell good. I'm just being 100. These are the reasons why I went to church. But once I got through teenage years and came to a young adult and started having real problems, I needed some real answers. The world wasn't offering me none. I had a job, I was making $25 an hour, but I was every N word in the book, cause the, the, the owners was white, I worked roofing, and they treated us like crap, we had to sit way out there, and I ended up quitting. My dude said, you crazy, man, you making all this money, you quit. I said, dude, money ain't the most important thing in my life. <laughs> had a kid when I was 20, and I was like, I don't want my kid to, to be like me. I want him to be better than me. And I start crying out, praying within myself, there's gotta be another way. There's got to be another way. That's all I kept saying. There's got to be another way. God, could, There is no way in the world if there's a God in heaven who created the, the ocean, the seas, the land. If, if he's real, if there's a real God, there's got to be another way. There ain't no way in the world that he favors one man over another man and, and, and that he would create me to be like this. The Bible says you can prove God. He says prove me. You have a right to ask God, God, if you God, show me you. But I tell people, before you pray that prayer, you better be ready to follow him because he's going to show you who he is. But he says, prove me. He, you're not going to be able to touch the nails where, where, where they nailed him. You're not going to be able to touch the side where they pierced him. But God says, prove me. Verse 28, and Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. So after Thomas actually touched where the spots where they pierced him at, now he's saying, I believe you. That's, what, that's why we call him Doubting Thomas. You may have heard that that. that that's where that saying comes from, doubting Thomas. 29, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Now here, this part is for us. It says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. The Bible says we blessed because we have not seen and yet believe. Let's do this one part. The Bible says we are blessed because we have not seen and yet believe. Now how can we be blessed because we have not seen? Because it takes faith to believe something that you can't see with your eyes. Have a seat. Because the definition of faith, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And you might be thinking, how can I believe something I don't see? Show me one person here that can see the air you're breathing right now. What color is the air? The air only smells bad when somebody farts. Other than that, you don't see the air. You don't see the what color. You see the trees moving, but you don't see what's pushing the trees. That's how faith is. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe you, Jesus, unless I can touch where they pierced you and touch where they, they pierced you on the side. But the Bible says you're blessed because you do not see and you still believe. That's what makes you blessed. But you're only going to get that through the Bible because the Bible says faith comes by hearing him by the word of God. How do I hear the word of God? These are three different ways you hear the word of God. You hear the word of God through the Holy Spirit. You hear the word of God through reading the scripture. And you hear the word of God by it being preached. Those are three ways you hear the word of God. That's why we always tell people, read your Bible. My mom used to say that when I was growing up. You used to get on my nerves, read your Bible, it's boring. Read the Bible, it's boring. Read the Bible, it's boring. And I never understood just by reading the Bible, it would increase my faith in the believing stuff that I couldn't see. I tell people all the time, your destiny is in the Bible. Your life is in the Bible. This is the best road map you can have for your life, is the Bible. I was speaking to a young man back here, me and Miss Marie, and we was just telling him, I said, dude, you're 22 years old. If somebody, if I had got a hold of this when I was young, I had a 21-year-old son who was wearing the NBA, he wouldn't be going to the NBA if he wasn't saved because he'd be a knucklehead, flat out. Because there's something about us when we're in our 20s, especially men, we just feel so much energy and, and we just want to go do this and we want to do that. We don't really know what we want to do. In the Jewish community, you're not even considered a man until you're 30 because there's so many things going on in your body and your mind. Your chemistry is just off. Your balance is crazy. 
You're trying to hit everything that move. You're a sex nut. You, your lust is all. That's just the truth. Men, y'all know how y'all are from 20 to 30? I was the same way. I, you know, I, it is what it is. Now, unfortunately, some guys <laughs> creep over to 35, 40, and they still act like they're 20. Say no names, Roscoe. Look at me all crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So I mean, so often, people always say, man, how you know that Bible is blah, blah, blah. Man, shut up. It says, many signs that are not written in this book. He did more stuff that's written, than is written in this book. He raised more people. He, he healed more people. You can't contain, you're, you're, you're a book. The Bible says we're living epistles known and seen of men. Don't you know when you have a funeral and they put your sunrise date and they put your death date and they had a little date thing there? That was your book from beginning to end. That was when you, your book started and that's when your book ended, when you passed. Every last one of us is a book because somebody knows you. Hey, man, you hear about so-and-so? Yeah, man, that's messed up. His book is all the way. And the only, th only thing we're going to know about that, that, that character when we get to heaven is if they made it or not. If we know that. I don't know if the Bible lets us know that we consciously know who made it and who didn't make it. But that's all that's going to matter. But when you're alive, you are a book. But if Jesus is not the author and the finisher of your faith, your book is going nowhere. you stuck in some. You stuck in the beginning somewhere. And, and you, this is what's amazing about rich and poor. The Bible says it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's hard. Poor people, if you're poor like me, we got the inside. If you poor, you in a good position to be a, a faith believer of Jesus Christ, cause you ain't got nothing in your way. What's karma drive? The Lambo, Mercedes, the Bugatti. We driving these feet. That's what we driving. <laughs> your choices are narrowed down. Well, I'm gonna go to this four star restaurant, this five star. No, we going to the Valley of Love to see what they got. That's where we going. When you poor, your choices are limited. And so Jesus should be easy. Lord, Lord, I know you didn't create me for this. That's what I told God. When, when I got real and I got sick of, the Bible says sick and tired of being sick and tired. When you get sick of your lies, lying to yourself, it's going to get better. How is it going to get better if you ain't doing nothing to make it better? That's what I'm trying to figure out. I tell people in closing right now that um, your life is almost like ingredients. Say somebody give you some ingredients to, to your favorite food. My grandmother used to make some biscuits before she passed away. She's the only person I make these biscuits, man. They was good. I grew up on them biscuits. Only person had the ingredients. No, you know, all my aunts, they didn't try, they didn't fail. I was like, give it up, man. Y'all messing up the memory. But the ingredients was perfect. And if you change one small ingredient, them things didn't come out right. That's how your life is with God. God has a way for you to be saved, a way for you to have a perfect life. I just found out when the Powerball was going on, because I don't gamble. I don't have to gamble. I'm guaranteed. I just found out that there are over 8,000 promises in the Bible. I didn't even know that. That's what I love about being a Christian, is when you think you know something, God will show you something that you ain't never seen before in your life to renew your faith in him. 8,000 promises in the Bible. Don't you know you're promised good health? The Bible says no plague should come nigh my dwelling. Your body is your dwelling. Sickness is not allowed to come in your body and take over your body. But if you don't know that, you can't speak that thing out of you. That's the faith you got to have in Jesus Christ. Don't you know that uh, he, he can, you can command the birds to come and feed you? There was birds that came and fed a prophet one time. He didn't have no food. And Jesus said, hey, go feed my man. Because the Bible says he cares more about you than he do the birds. You ain't never seen no bird out there with a sign saying we'll work for food. Ever. And you ain't never going to see it because he take care of them. All of them. Final verse. But these are written that ye might believe. That's what it says in verse 31 in chapter 20. But these are written that this Bible was put together so you could believe. People say, well, I don't believe in Jesus. Well, you ever read your Bible? No. Well, that's why you don't believe. You're not going to be able to put your hands where they pierce him. You're not going to be able to touch his side. Where they, but you can read the Bible if you believe it. I was on the phone last night chapter with my 21-year-old son. The one I'm talking about. I talk about him a lot because he's the one that's most like me. He's crazy. Well, I believe. They, people say I got crazy faith because what kind of person would close up 21 ministries leave his family and come to Florida someplace he don't even know and never been before, pack a van, get rid of everything because God told him. Sean would. I'm like this. I'm either going to believe God or I'm not. I can't be 99 and a half. I'm either going to do it or I'm not. That's the way you got to be. You can't be halfway. Y'all know that. I ain't, I'm not preaching to the choir. Y'all know you can't do nothing halfway and it work out all the way. 
So I'm either going to do it. I did the same thing for New Orleans. They said, we, need, we want you to go to New Orleans. I'm like, okay, let's go. That's it. Yeah, let's go. I ain't scared. I ain't never been. Don't go to the east side, man. They kill people. They murder people. Cars upside down. Police don't even go on there. I said, if God be for me, who can be against me? My angel ten times bigger than me. I ain't worried about what no gun, what nobody done hurt. They said, don't go to Detroit on the east side. Let's go to the east side. What's wrong with you, man? I said, God sent me here for a reason, a season, a mission, and an assignment. And if God sent me, I can go. Now, there are places in the scripture where people done went where God didn't take them and the, the demons stripped them butt naked and had them running and screaming called the sons of Sceva. I've been with some crazy nuts like that. Hey, man, let's go in this bar. Dude, you go in that bar, you get beat up. But God, nah, bro. God ain't tell us to go in there. You want to go in there. Got beat up. Man, the Lord got, no, you got you a black eye. Verse 31 said, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Your life is only through the name of Jesus Christ. I don't care what your name is. If you don't put, if your, if your life is through the name of Jesus Christ, period. Why? Because he created you. He died for you. He rose again for you. All, all the power, demons fear his name. That's how powerful, you can't drop nobody's name on this earth. You can't say Obama or Trump and get any credits. Ain't no street creds in those names. But I dare you to call on the name of Jesus. I dare you. And, I, and you know what? I'm, I'm not like this because I choose to be. I'm like this because he created me like this. I've been to hospitals. They, I got fired from OSU Hospital as a police officer because we established a 2.30 prayer and people started coming to the prayer and was getting healed. The hospital is a business. They don't want people healed. They want you to stay sick. That's how they make their money. But me and some other preachers, we established a 2.30 prayer on our break. In a room, they let us in a break room. They found out about it, and I got fired. Ain't nobody else get fired. I got fired. I'm like, so be it. Last job I ever worked in my life. I said, that's it, devil. I ain't never going back to work. Now I'm doing full-time ministry. Should have never fired me. At least when I was at a job, you knew where I was at. Now you never know where I'm going. I'm going to go all over the world preaching the gospel to anybody and, and everybody who are here. I tell people all the time, I dare you to call on the name of Jesus Christ and mean it and believe it. Your life will change, period, flat out. I got videos on YouTube when I was a knucklehead. You can look at me, man, you look different. You're right, I was full of sin. I was real different. Five of my homeboys got murdered. I shared this with Miss Marie yesterday. When I finally made my mind to come to Christ, I had a shop called The Shop. It was an airbrush shop. I had booths in there, and I let all the artists rent the booths out to do airbrushing. And then a couple of my friends called me up, hey, Sean, let, let's use your, your address as a front shop so we can filter our drug money. And I was like, you know, as long as y'all ain't bringing that in here, I'm cool, because... I did a lot of stuff, but my grandma and my grandma, I wasn't going to jail for that and had them break their hearts. So I said, they was using my address as a front shop. It was fired. Then his, he told his buddy, hey, Sean, I was like, give me give me $1,000 a month to let you do it. So all these dudes was using it. So five total. One month at a time, all them cats got murdered. One dude had his baby in his hands. Heard him knock on the door. Opened the door. Boom, dude shot him. Didn't even rob him. Just shot him. Went to one funeral. A couple days later, boom, another one got murdered. All these dudes was connected to me. So I'm sitting in my shop like, oh, my God, this is ridiculous. You know, I ain't no thug. We ain't going to get no guns, go after nobody. I'm like, what in the world's going on? And I was at a crossroads in my life because I knew I should have been doing better. And, and I went to the last funeral. I'm sitting there. young. It's messed up when you're a young dude and you see your homeboy in a casket. That's not a good sight. You ain't supposed to see that. And they, they so cool. He in Timberlands in a sweatsuit. I'm like, hey, man, we, we just hood. They don't even put him in suits. Whatever. But anyway, I'm sitting there, and I say, God, what in the world's going on? Because I'm in a church, and I'm not normally in no church. He said, you next. As y'all hear me talking right now, that's what God said, you next. He said, I did not birth you to do what you want to do. I birthed you for my purpose. And if you ain't going to come with me, I'm going to remove my hand from you and let you have yourself. That's the worst thing that could ever happen to everybody in here is for you to be given over to yourself. Most of us can't even remember where we put our keys at half the time. Can you imagine being in control of your own life? Don't quit looking at Miss Marie. <laughs> Can you imagine being in control of your own life? I mean, look, I, I'm going to look at myself. Look, look at my life now. There's things that I need fixed that I don't know how to fix. There's things that I need right now that I can't afford. My credit score is horrible. I ain't got no money. I don't get no check. <laughs> I don't get paid from the Valley of Love. There's things I need God to do that only God can do. I got seven, ten kids Seven biological that I need angels to protect. I don't want to pick up no phone call and say, hey, man, got some bad news. I don't want to hear that. So I need God to protect my kids. I can't be there. I can't be in seven different places seven times. There's things in my life that only God can do. 
So I need Jesus Christ every single day. I can't afford not to read, not to pray, not to stay faithful. And when you come to that realization, your life will change. When you realize you, you'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold, you'd rather have Jesus than the air you breathe, everything will change. You got to make him first. That's it. So you just got to ask yourself, like the, the title of the sermon, have you seen the Lord? They went to the tomb. His body wasn't there. They was like, they done stole the body. He told you he was going to get up. And you believe by this. This is how you start believing. Start reading the Bible. I tell, I tell my kids, there's some interesting stories in there. Some, there's some great stories in the Bible. And they will increase your faith. Let us stand so we can pray. We're done. I don't know where you're at in your life, your walk, your talk, but I know where you can go. I don't know how your body's feeling. I don't know what the doctor just said, but I know somebody who's, who created the doctor, who created the doctor, who created the doctor. And if you can believe any part of this scripture, you can have what God said you can have, flat out. I don't care what the world done told you. I would love to see anybody except Jesus Christ now and come back a few months later or whatever and talk about how great their life is because they just decided to believe. It's just that simple. It is. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard. We thank you, Father God, that you are the person that created us, not man. Man cannot take credit for what you've done, Father God. Man can't take credit for our heart pumping blood through our body right now. Man can't take credit for our eyes working. Man can't take credit in the name of Jesus for our brain and our mind being in our right mind. I just ask right now in the name of Jesus, Father God, that you touch every single person in this room from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet, Father God. They all have a specific need and desire, Father God. Someone needs healing. Someone needs deliverance. Someone needs, Father God, just, just a peace of mind, Lord Jesus. I just pray, Father God, you send a peace that surpasses all understanding. Whatever it is they're seeking, Father God, I pray you give them you and help them understand who you are, Father God. Let them understand that if they owe taste and see, Father God, they can believe in the name of Jesus. Let them start reading the Bible and that Bible become alive to them in the name of Jesus. Some of these folks got kids they ain't seen in so long. I just pray, Father God, you allow them, whatever makes their heart happy, Father God, you give it to them and let them experience you, Father God, and want you more than they want anything else. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Amen.